Good morning and welcome to everyone joining us today for this event with the chair of the European Central Bank Supervisory Board, Andrea Enria. Good morning, Andrea. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Good morning, Georgina. My pleasure. <laughs> It is an honor for us to be taking part one more year to the European Youth Event in partnership with our colleagues from the European Parliament to talk about a topic that might not come as a given to most of you, which is why does banking supervision matter for your daily lives and also for your future plans. So I would like to encourage all of you to join today's discussion by sending us your questions. These kind of initiatives are very important for us at the European Central Bank because they are a very good opportunity to engage with young people like you, to get to know you better, and even more importantly, understand how can we be of better help to you. So please send us your questions during today's event. Uh, to do that, all you have to do is log into slido.com, type in the code hashtag AskECB, and then type your question and send it to us. However, please keep in mind that the questions will be moderated so that we can ensure that we have as many different topics as possible to pose our questions to Mr. Enria today. And this is also the reason why it might take some time until you see the question popping up on your screen right after you've sent it. Of course, as soon as you start seeing other people's questions, I invite you to vote for the ones that you find the most interesting and now, without further ado, let me properly welcome our speaker today. Andrea, good morning. I am very excited to have you here today. Thank you very much, Georgina. I'm very glad uh, to, be, uh, to be with you and, uh, and I'm happy to welcome all the people joining online from Strasbourg and across all of Europe. Uh, I must say I'm particularly glad to see the, how many young Europeans are interested in the rather arcane subject of uh, uh, banking supervision. Um, and uh, uh, I remember when I was a young economist uh, just hired by the uh, Bank of Italy, uh, my major uh, objective was to get a job uh, in the research department dealing with the big questions of uh, uh, inflation, growth, uh, interest rate, fiscal policy. So when I was assigned to banking supervision and more specifically to department that was called programs and authorizations, I was, I must say, really disappointed. I thought that these all sounded very uh, bureaucratic, uh, boring, and I couldn't be more wrong. Uh, I must say that uh, since the very first day, I, I, I became very passionate about this job, and as it is uh, for most of the people, for most of my colleagues in the same uh, line of business. And, uh, and uh, it is an extremely challenging job where you learn everything new uh, every day, I would say, even uh, at my old age, uh, 35 years in the, in the profession. And I hope here today that I can instill some of these, uh, you know, interest in the job in, in many of you so that some could maybe choose uh, to develop their career in, uh, in financial supervision, as we do need uh, bright young uh, people helping us out. Uh, but this meeting is important to me also for another reason, more, more profound maybe, um, and it is that your generation and the one immediately before you have been hit particularly hard by the triple whammy of the great financial crisis in 2009, uh, the uh, sovereign debt crisis in the euro area in 2012, and then the, 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 the pandemic, the COVID-19 crisis in, 20, in, 20, in 2020. The, the labor market has been very, very difficult for young Europeans. I see uh, my daughters, their friends, uh, and I see uh, young Europeans with outstanding CVs, having done uh, uh, postgraduate studies, maybe more than, more than one degree, in, uh, uh, often in countries different from their own home country, uh, having done uh, outstanding, uh, very selective uh, internship programs around Europe, uh, maybe around the world sometimes, and this notwithstanding, sometimes it's so difficult to find a... a, a a formative, well-paid job uh, at this, uh, at this uh, stage. And uh, so it is first and foremost with the prospect of your generation in mind that I would like to um, look at uh, the role that uh, uh, banks and by reflection banking supervision and have played and could play 
uh, through these uh, these uh, these uh, crises. Uh, so what happened? If you look at the great financial crisis, you have a, a, a tale of uh, uh, bankers' uh, uh, excesses. So uh, excessive risk taking. Um, uh, excessive complexity, so financial innovation that was mainly used to uh, to, to to push up short-term profits, uh, irrespective of the long-term risk that were taken, and uh, um, and excessive leverage, so too little capital to shelter the losses uh, uh, when these risks materialize, and, uh, and and the outcome was that uh, unfortunately there was a need for uh, massive support, financial support from governments when the crisis materialized to bail out uh, uh, banks and avoid the meltdown of the financial sector and protect the savings of households and uh, ensure continued financing of, of FERC. But this came to a, 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 great, uh, a great cost and uh, uh, to avoid that this uh, happens again, of course, it was very important uh, to engage at the global level as we did with a massive program of uh, regulatory reforms and strengthening of uh, supervision. And it is important that we preserve, this is something, this is a hard won uh, result and we need to preserve it. And sometimes I see lobbying from banks to deregulate, to go back to some of the uh, old uh, practices, and I think we should be very careful uh, in that uh, in that space. Uh, the, the, the the sovereign debt crisis is uh, is instead is peculiar of the euro area, and it highlights some severe weaknesses of the um, construction of the monetary union. And uh, um, it showed in particular the strong connection between banks and their sovereigns. So we were in a monetary union but each bank in each country was strongly linked to the sovereign in that country. And it happened in through uh, different mechanisms. Sometimes the connection ran in, in different uh, directions. So we had, for instance, that the impact of the great financial crisis on the Irish banks was so huge that it created a major problem also for the, uh, for the public budget. So for continuing you know, uh, uh, social expenditures and, and the like, and uh, the government had to ask for support from the, uh, from the, European, uh, from the European Union, from the European uh, Financial Stability Fund. Uh, in, in Greece, the, the, the link ran the uh, opposite direction. So it was the public finances that went into troubles, uh, with a widening of spreads, with a se severe risk perceived in the Greek bonds, and this uh, 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 brought to contagion of the banks that went into troubles and uh, and uh, created a, a lot of concerns for again households, firms, and the economy at large. Um, and uh, what is important to understand is that at that moment there was. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the integrity of the monetary union was at stake because uh, there was the perception that one euro deposited in a bank uh, uh, in a country under stress was not of the same value of a euro deposited in a bank uh, in a country which was not uh, under, under stress. And this implied that deposits started flowing from the former to the latter. And this has been very destabilizing and, and really putting the, the whole integrity of the euro area at stake. And it is only thanks to the bold measures that the ECB to, took at the time and the decision eventually of, uh, of uh, the, the European Council, the Parliament to uh, centralize banking supervision and banking resolution, creating the banking union that uh, the problem was dealt with uh, effectively. Um, also, thanks to this, uh, the, the response to these two crises, so to the financial uh, reforms, the financial regulation reforms, and to the establishment of the banking union, banks came to the appointment with the third shock, with the pandemic shock, uh, much stronger. And that was very important because banks in our system, especially in Europe, more than in other in our countries such as the US, are key in the financing of all type of firms, from the small shop to the to the la very large corporate, the large uh, airline company, for instance. And so, having uh, you know these uh, the, the the banks uh, continuing to support the economy in front of the shock was uh, of paramount importance, especially when the governments took the 
decisions to put our uh, economies in lockdown, basically, our, uh, our, not our economy, our society in lockdown, uh, these, of course, impair not only the ability of uh, borrowers to pay their debt to banks, uh, but also uh, it created a, a huge uh, necessity to continue financing you know, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, companies and households also throughout, uh, throughout the pandemic where maybe their income was not, uh, was not there anymore. And, uh, and I think that thanks to the massive support measures that have been deployed by government, but also thanks to the uh, attitude of banks that managed to you know, continue supporting their customers also throughout uh, difficult periods that we have been able to overcome at least the first phase of this difficult uh, crisis. For banks, it was very difficult because, of course, when you have a moment in which you have measures such as uh, payment holidays, for instance, it's very difficult for a bank to distinguish uh, risky customers from no risky ones. So, uh, so the, 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 at the ECB, uh, banking supervision, uh, we uh, tried to support this process. So for the first time, we gave a very prompt, unified European answer with policies that uh, um, were aimed at creating space for the banks to really support the economy. So giving them some uh, breathing space also from the supervisor regulatory point of view, uh, but also on the other hand, being very tight on the uh, assessment of risk, because what you don't want in a crisis like that is that banks become lax and then you build up of risk that then materializes in a, in a crisis at a, later, at a later stage. So I think that was very, very important. And now, uh, let's say, if I look at uh, what is keeping busy right now, uh, of course, we don't have only uh, the firefighting task in crisis, it's also trying to uh, uh, prevent future crises. And uh, if you look at the structural changes we are grappling with right now as, as a European uh, society, uh, the um, uh, transformation of our economies uh, towards uh, a low carbon economy and uh, the green and climate issues are becoming of paramount importance. So how does banking supervision fit into this picture? Of course, banks will play a, a, a major role in financing this transformation of our economy. And uh, in doing so, it is important that they are very alert to the uh, risks of, of this transformation, especially climate risks. No? Uh, so uh, both the physical risks, so the risk that there will be uh, more frequent uh, 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 floods or wildfires that will affect, you know, destroy houses and, and, uh, and uh, livelihoods of, uh, of our citizens. Um, but also transition risks. So there is that the transition to a low carbon economy could be particularly bumpy, maybe because the governments do not react uh, fast enough and then they have to steepen up their uh, response at a, later, at a later stage, disrupting also the price mechanisms and the, the balance between sectors. So uh, uh, by pushing banks to consider these risks, we force them to think long term, to think also to these long term risks and to uh, make this themselves better in supporting exactly this, uh, this much needed uh, transition. Uh, so they will serve better uh, themselves, their balance sheet, they will serve better their customers in the Euro area and the whole planet as a, as a result. So I, Georgina, I hope you, I was able to cover a little bit of examples of the things uh, we are grappling with, why banking supervision has been so important also for uh, young, uh, young Europeans. And uh, I hope I gave you also a flavor of how challenging and interesting this job is, but I, I, I do really look forward to the questions and to the interaction with, uh, with the whole audience uh, to, to uh, respond to your questions and maybe also touch on some uh, uh, features of our daily jobs and see whether any of, uh, of, of the young uh, connected today uh, can, can be attracted by this type of job. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Andrea, for these very insightful remarks. And I am very sure that if we have any aspiring supervisors in the room, I think they were 
a very motivational boost. So that's really good. And I mean, let's just jump straight into it. Let's start to um, our Q&A session. But I would actually like to begin the other way around. I would like that for starters, we ask you questions that you will answer for us. So I'd like to invite all of you to please go to our Slido event and answer a couple of questions that we prepared for you to get to know you better and see a little bit uh, where are we standing for today's event. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for you to do that. And in the meantime, I'd like to use this opportunity to ask um, Andrea today a question that I'm personally quite curious about. Um, you mentioned, Andrea, that at the beginning, banking supervision didn't came to you as a, let's say, a passion from the start. It's something that increased later. And I'm wondering what good you said right now, it's the, your favorite part of your job. What do you like the most of it? Well, I don't know whether I will do a favor to the job of supervision, but uh, let's say what uh, um, what uh, really attracts me to my job right now is really the European dimension. So the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you do connect with uh, uh, very diverse problems in the in in the in the banking union across uh, across our area and you have every day you know a different challenge and it's so uh, varied so uh, you know um, stimulating but especially you always have on the back of your mind that you are serving the interest of european citizens and that's uh, i think uh, in terms of motivation that's something that no other job can give you i think Thank you. That was quite inspirational. Um, let's have a look at our audience. Let's see if we've given them sufficient time to answer. I think so. We have here in front of us a screen where we can see the results and also the, the questions that you submit. And it's very interesting to see that most of you um, are, are willing to learn and improve your knowledge in banking supervision. And I think that's a great starting point for today's event. And if I look at the next question you answered for us, um, I can see that most of you agree that we need healthy banks to have a healthy economy. Uh, I'm sure we will be talking more about this in today's event. Uh, so now, yes, without further ado, are you ready, Andrea? Shall ready. we start? Shoot. <laughs> then uh, let's go for it. And our first question is from Maria, who wonders, during the pandemic, banks have increased their leverage significantly. How do you ensure that banks continue fit for purpose? Uh, well, um, as a matter of fact, banks themselves have not increased their leverage, uh, especially if you look at the risk based measures of leverage, banks have improved their capitalizations. So they have raised uh, their their capital compared to the overall balance sheet uh, size of their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I think that uh, uh, the question is right in the sense that there has been a, a huge increase in the leverage in the economies at large. And uh, this is increasingly financed by non-bank financial institutions. But these non-bank financial institutions, to a large extent, take their funds from banks. So um, this is making my job more difficult, the <laughs> job of supervisors more difficult because uh, uh, it's not sufficient to look in the bank's balance sheets, but it's important to understand how uh, the uh, contagion could run through a non-bank financial sector, which is uh, in most cases not regulated or very lightly regulated. So you don't have a lot of visibility on these risks. So now they, we had uh, recently, you know, in uh, before the summer, this case of a, a small U.S. family office, you no, know, Archegos was called, uh, that went uh, bust creating more than 10 billions of losses to the largest global banks indirectly no uh, in, in, so where you expect uh, the the risk management to be at the top level no so that's that's really the, what concerns me and mm -hmm. what uh, uh, that uh, you have indeed a massive increase in leverage in the economy and that especially when we are going to exit from this uh, extraordinary low interest rate environment I mean, it might be uh, difficult, and uh, and these non-bank financial institutions and the indirect risk on banks are very, very delicate. I think. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, our next question, which received quite a number of votes, so it seems many of you are interested. Uh, Martin asked it and it says, is open banking the future of banks in general? And is that the right path to open finance? Look, open banking has been, uh, now sometimes let, let's try to clarify the terminology, at least as I understand it, no? Uh, there has been a, 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 a strong pressure from uh, policymakers at the European level, especially in the payments area, to uh, enable more competition. So to enable more uh, non-bank uh, payment providers, uh, such as uh, PayPal, Klarna, and the like, to uh, access directly the bank accounts, your bank account, and to uh, initiate your payment so that you can realize on other smart operators, technological uh, companies uh, to get a better service. And that was important because banks were charging very high fees in this area, there was little competition and consumers were not served well enough. I remember, especially at the European level, to move funds from one member state to another, I mean, it was really a pain, both in terms of the time you needed and the fees that you were, you were supposed to pay. So uh, I think that uh, opening the bank's accounts and enabling more competition in, in, in that area has been indeed a a, a most important uh, development and very much welcome. Um, now, um, what does this mean and what does the technological developments mean for uh, banks in general and banking services in general? This is a question to which I think if anybody tells you that uh, he or she has an answer, is lying. <laughs> um, I think it's very difficult now to understand. Um, uh, my impression is that at the moment, this uh, um, opening also through technologies of financial services is affecting some segments in which indeed the banks were excessively um, charging excessive fees. So consumer finance, payments, in other areas, so like financing, you know, uh, the green transformation projects and the like, I think banks, especially in Europe, still have an important, uh, an important advantage. Uh, but I think that they need to invest in digitalization as well, because otherwise, yes, it is possible that they will find themselves uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in extinction mode. I remember there was a, an article by um, Bill Gates, actually, in the late 90s saying uh, about dinosaur banking, no? so, uh, defining brick and mortar banking as dinosaur banking. And I think he's right. he was right then, and uh, we are now seeing that. Uh, brick and mortar branch banking is probably going to extinction, but this doesn't mean that banks uh, necessarily will go to extinction as well. They need to react. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. I guess progress never comes without challenges, right? Um, our next question, I think many of our participants today are wondering about this. Um, Alex ask, asks you, um, as a young European, why is banking supervision important to me? You know, again, uh, the, 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 the issue is that uh, banking are a, an important uh, technology in a sense that we invented some time ago uh, to make sure that you can give to the, um, uh, to the savers the safety on their funds, on the fact that their funds are safe, uh, depositors in particular, and at the same time finance uh, more illiquid, more risky projects that are important to, you know, to push growth in our economies. To do that, banks are traditionally highly leveraged institutions. So if they go bust, then you have a, a, a double whammy on both sides of the balance sheets. On the one hand, you have the problem for your savings that are in the bank and many people panic. Do you remember in the some of you maybe uh, no some maybe you are you are too young to remember but uh, uh, even northern rock in 2008 i think it was 7 8 uh, you had queues of people with wheelchairs in front of the banks because they were concerned they were unable to move their deposits from the bank uh, 
uh, online and they, they were queuing the night uh, in front of the banks to get their savings back. And on the asset side, because of course, when the operation of the banks is disrupted, I mean, firms that need, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the liquidity to run their their their, their operations every day uh, can get into 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 great trouble. So, um, is there a peculiarity for you being young in that? Well, maybe uh, being young, uh, you don't have huge uh, stack of savings yet. <laughs> I hope you will make a good one uh, going forward. Uh, but still, I think that uh, you, as I mentioned before, I mean, you've seen on your on your experience that uh, if banks enter into difficulties, then the economy uh, goes uh, to the to the floor. And this is bad for employment, is bad for growth, and is bad especially uh, for the youth unemployment. We have seen the youth unemployment uh, skyrocketing compared to the general uh, unemployment figures. Right? So I think that's the most important point. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, our next question goes back to the topic we were mentioning earlier about banks' health. Um, Massimo asks, when it comes to a healthy bank, is it in terms of stability or also profitability? There is a trade-off between the two components, post-pandemic, and what scenario will accompany banks, in your view? Look, profitability, I mean, I don't see this trade-off between profitability and stability. Uh, so a, 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 a sound bank needs to be able to make profits, to attract investors, and uh, if it has also some troubles, needs to have, you know, the ability to tell investors, uh, uh, I will make profits in the future and remunerate your investment. So that's important for the, also for the stability of uh, of the bank. Of course, there, there could be a trade-off in certain circumstances. Uh, when the banks start uh, uh, becoming more fragile, then they can start taking uh, uh, bets in the markets, a uh, strategy that sometimes is called gamble for resurrection. No? So you're starting getting weak, and then you say, okay, I'll invest in riskier uh, areas so that uh, if the gamble works, I get the money and I restore my viability. And usually these strategies all end wrong, which is one of the reasons why our job is important. Because when you see a bank becoming weak, you need to intensify the monitoring on their uh, on their risk taking. So there isn't this, uh, this uh, trade-off. I think that... Uh, Post-pandemic, uh, we do also have a structural challenge to push banks to invest more in digitalization, to be able to serve better their customers, and uh, to become more profitable also and more viable in the in the longer term. If the banks miss the train of uh, digitalization and climate change, I think that uh, they, they they will be in trouble. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we will get more questions on that topic later on. But now the next one is um, quite personal. Alexandra wants to know what words would you, um, what words of advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, well, I mean, invest in yourself. Really, I think that the most important thing is uh, is investing in uh, in learning. Whenever you choose a path in your professional development, uh, try to choose the path that uh, increases the most your, I mean, uh, the economists call it human capital. No, uh, Sometimes I thought this was a bit, uh, you know, um, a bit cold, no, uh, talking about capital when you talk about people, but it is a, it is a good, uh, uh, I mean, it is your wealth, actually, no, uh, how much in, you, you learn. I mean, the, the, the Anglo-Saxons uh, generally tend to say that there is a sequence in your professional development, no, learn, earn, serve, no, <laughs> and uh, so first you, you learn, uh, then you start making some money, <laughs> and then, and then when you have enough money, you start uh, serving the community in a, in a more direct way. Uh, now, for those who do my job, uh, Maybe you, you don't earn that much uh, that you could do in the, in, the, in, the, in the private sector, but you have the benefit of serving from the very beginning. So of feeling this, uh, this sense of service from the very beginning. But I think that the learn part, especially in the first part of your career, is the most important. So if you have to choose a job, 
uh, yeah, look at uh, the pace leap, but uh, look especially at uh, uh, the, if you have people there that can teach you, that can pass to you knowledge, that can really make you grow, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I agree. And, and I could imagine now some of our viewers nodding at the screen while you, while you say this. Um, our next question, uh, reading it, I just realized we've been talking a lot about banks' health, but actually we haven't, decide, we haven't defined what, what is, what are healthy banks. And this is Masha's next question. She's wondering what are healthy banks and how can she know as a consumer if her bank is a healthy one? Well, uh, there are many ingredients of what defines a healthy bank. Uh, I think uh, uh, one thing that I learned uh, throughout my career is that one key ingredient is governance. No? So, uh, and this honestly is not true only for banks, it's true for any organization, including our. Uh, so if you have, uh, uh, you know, um, processes that select uh, 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 the members of the board, the managers, uh, uh, people that have the right moral compass, uh, that have, uh, uh, that are diverse also, diverse not only in terms of uh, gender, maybe race, but also diverse in terms of skills, of uh, knowledge, uh, so that you can have a good, uh, um, you know, mix, uh, a mix of people in the, in the, in the top, uh, in the top management. Governance is, and especially, having good challenge in within organization when you have the, the thing that i learned the most is that when you have a bank which is dominated by a very strong personality that, that nobody uh, dares to challenge that's a bank that can do huge profits for a certain period of time and then generally crashes against the wall so governance is a key is a key element of course in terms of financial a well capitalized bank is a is a more solid bank uh, and uh, and uh, um, the on the asset side what we look at is the asset quality so how much uh, uh, loans are non performing which is a signal that the bank has been granted loans to customers that uh, did not warrant uh, to be uh, to be uh, those, uh, those 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 loans and uh, and uh, um, so these, these are the main ingredients. But the second part of the question is the most important, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, having supervision, to some extent, is done exactly in order not to have customers uh, bothering about, uh, about uh, the, the quality of the bank. Uh, if you invest in a bond, if you invest in, in shares, you need to read the prospectus and understand uh, which uh, let's say, which investments you are making. So what is the quality of the issuer? Uh, and you have to take a responsibility. If things go wrong, it's your responsibility. You take the loss. Uh, when you put your deposit at the bank, in most cases, you choose the bank that is close to your home or close to your office, uh, uh, maybe the one which has the best uh, app uh, <laughs> to, to, to access the services but you shouldn't really uh, be requested to understand whether this bank is sold or not. That's delegated to us. So we act on your behalf in that respect, which is what makes our job also, you know, uh, carrying a big weight of responsibility to some extent, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's how we see it. Yeah, and I think that's also a very good example that explains to young people another reason why they should actually um, care about uh, banking supervision as well. Um, our next question from Alex, based on the challenging labor market situation, how can you still distinguish yourself in order to enter into the financial sector? Well, the, the financial sector, uh, I don't know, I, I tell you how it should be. I'm not sure, especially if you look at the private sector, this is indeed the case. But uh, um, uh, I think that there was a moment in, uh, in, um, in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, in which uh, um, the greatest uh, uh, asset to enter a well-paid job in the financial sector uh, was, for instance, to be a quant to have uh, high skills in modeling. Uh, uh, I remember there was a huge wave of people graduated in physics that entered the financial, uh, the financial industry. And uh, that was important because, uh, not only because uh, uh, models were uh, becoming the, 
uh, also recognized by regulators, uh, were becoming the, the key yardstick uh, to uh, uh, assess risk, but also because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, banks were engineering uh, more and more complex products, and that would require a lot of uh, mm -hmm. skills in terms of uh, uh, modeling the features of these products. Uh, I hope that this age of complexity, and although, let's say, of course, quants are very welcome in, industry, in the industry, and, uh, and, uh, and it is a in very important skill set to access uh, finance uh, today, I think that now uh, uh, there should be a search for a, a, a wider set of competencies. And I think that uh, if I had to say, uh, the, 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 the skills, I mean, again, it's, uh, in my view, you need a broad understanding of, uh, uh, you know, economic concept, but you need also to be able to read some regulations <laughs> because it's a highly regulated environment. So you need to develop also these, uh, uh, these type of skills. And, uh, and especially, uh, I think that you will need more and more uh, knowledge on uh, uh, new technologies. I mean, this is becoming... Uh, a, an asset which is in high demand uh, uh, in uh, in in the banking in the banking industry. But again, I would uh, strongly argue that uh, the necessary ingredient is also your your values. Huh? So uh, uh, there was an, a book. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author. I'm afraid uh, my memory. Uh, but uh, uh, during the Great Depression, though, that drove also the reforms in the in the in the U.S. Uh, uh, regulation uh, by a uh, very renowned uh, judge, you know, that has seen uh, really the the, the 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 crisis in the banking sector, and uh, um, it was in uh, the, the heading of the book is other people's money. So banks play with other people's money. So they need to carry the responsibility of that, and they need to have uh, strong values uh, to do this job properly. Thank you. Our next question touches upon um, a topic that you mentioned also before, which is climate change. Uh, Marie is asking, how are banks affected by climate change, and how can they contribute to accelerate the green transition? Well, banks are affected very directly by climate change. Of course, I mean, we've seen this uh, summer also flood, flooding, wildfires. I mean, these events uh, destroy houses, properties, uh, uh, you know, uh, firms. So, and, and these are counterparts of banks. So if you had accepted this uh, uh, building as a collateral, of course, you, you as a bank have lost your money. And, uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> And as I mentioned before, uh, be besides the physical risk, there is also the transition risk that, in my view, is maybe less immediate, but uh, is a risk that I think is very relevant. So the risk that, uh, you know, because of the difficulty of doing the right thing from the political point of view in supporting the green transition, uh, politicians that need to be reelected will be under great pressure by their voters, you know, not to take choices that might damage maybe uh, some companies or, or destroy some works or so some job opportunities in some areas because, uh, and because of that, they could be late in really uh, uh, driving the, the transition. And then it could be, as these processes tend to be non-linear, you can come to a point where you need to accelerate very fast the repair measures, the policy measures. And these could be very disruptive also in terms of uh, uh, some sectors uh, being requested not to smoothly move to a, a low carbon uh, economy, to a low carbon processes, but to really get out of the market uh, uh, from one day to the other. So that's the second big risk. And of course, if banks are heavily exposed to these sectors, they will pay a big price. Um, so the, 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 the key point for us uh, is uh, that banks manage these risks proactively now, so they cannot wait. Sometimes I hear people saying, you know, if you look at the average duration of a bank portfolio, three to five years, you know, so uh, three to five years, not much will happen. So why should banks move now? No? And, uh, and, and this is myopic in my view. I think that uh, uh, exactly because uh, these changes are going to happen maybe 10, 20 years from now, you need to act now 
to avoid that this is so disruptive, not only on the banks, but also on the, on the community at large. Uh, so they need to actively manage this uh, risk, try to get the information. Information is the first point. We are running a climate stress test next year, and uh, the banks were complaining because we are asking data they don't have. They say, for instance, we are asking the energy performance certificate of the building that they have uh, accepted as collateral. And they say, we don't have this information. And our response is, okay, we can do proxies and estimate, but you need to have this information because this information is relevant. In the Netherlands, already the government, uh, the parliament has passed a law that if you have, for instance, asbestos in your buildings, I mean, the building uh, uh, cannot be used anymore as office or residence uh, from a certain date onward. So if you have asbestos in the offices, uh, in, in that building, the collateral value goes to zero. You lose all the money tomorrow. So there could be policies that have big impact and banks need to get this information right now. So uh, that's, uh, that's an important point. We keep pushing the banks. And I must say that uh, they have been uh, uh, candid in admitting that they are quite far away from where we want them to be, but also uh, responsive in the sense that they understand that they need to move and to move fast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Climate change is on top of our challenges, but not the only one. And uh, Christian is asking precisely about another one of this, which is the pandemic. In your view, Andrea, what are the key challenges for European banks beyond the pandemic? Well, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at beyond the pandemic, so when the pandemic and its effects are, are done and over, I think, again, digitalization and climate change are the two main challenges. But we do have some way to get there still. No? Uh, so the pandemic is still with us. And I've seen, you know, different uh, uh, phases in our way of uh, thinking to the impact uh, of the pandemic. So the, 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 the first phase um, was basically, um, you know, uh, very concerned that there would have been a, a genuine systemic stability impact so that there could be so many corporates defaulting uh, so many households unable to pay their, their debt that uh, uh, you could have uh, a massive uh, stability problem in the European banking sector. Uh, now the pendulum, and that was with hindsight, was probably an excessive concern because there has been so much support from governments and from monetary policy, by the way, uh, to uh, the economy that this uh, risk has not materialized as, uh, as deeply as we expected. Uh, corporate uh, uh, insolvencies have started increasing a tiny bit, but they're still below the pre-pandemic level. Mm -hmm. Still, uh, now the pendulum is switching a little bit, swinging a little bit too much in the other direction. So I see banks, but also uh, the general, uh, I mean, economists, starting developing an excessively rosy expectation. So the problem is gone. Uh, asset quality problems will not materialize. And, uh, and we are now uh, in a rebound, uh, in a faster rebound of our economy. Everything will be well. Uh, I think that uh, uh, although there is going to be a rebound in our economy, a strong rebound in our economy, it might be uneven across sectors, across uh, 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 firms. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, take uh, commercial real estate. Will we have uh, the same uh, price for office space going forward if, if eventually we will have much more reliance on remote working, as we have seen during the pandemic? Uh, so uh, airlines, uh, will we have people traveling by plane as much as they did before the, the, the pandemic? Will the, also the uh, environmental footprint of certain of certain uh, sectors of firms be a, a, an important element in understanding who comes back after the pandemic and who c does not come back after the pandemic. So it can still be that we have, uh, you know, uh, problems that materialize from now uh, until the exit. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, that's why we are encouraging banks to be very very focused on effective risk controls because that's the, the key element to, to avoid big damages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, going back to um, challenges, 
Uh, Emma asks, how do you imagine that banking supervision will change and adapt in response to the introduction of a digital euro and also with the increasing popularity of cryptocurrencies and stable coins? Uh, can we go to the next question? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, that's a question on which uh, I'm. I, to be honest, I'm thinking a lot. I don't have yet a lot of uh, a lot of answers. Um, um, I think that behind, uh, let's say, uh, all these uh, innovations, uh, there are important uh, technological shifts. There are important. Uh, innovations such as uh, uh, distributed ledger uh, technology and the like that can really make a change in a number of areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, sometimes I see that uh, the gut reaction of uh, policymakers is uh, we need to regulate. We need to and uh, and uh, and I think it's very difficult, no? Because on the one hand, you don't want to jump the gun and start, uh, you know, killing all innovations in your in your uh, jurisdiction uh, by submitting, uh, you know, new startups that develop new products in, uh, in, in, in and requiring high compliance costs. Um, on the other hand, of course, there are risks. We have seen already, especially in the in the in the crypto asset space, uh, uh, people losing money. Uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, uh, exchanges are failing from one day to the other, and there is a very legitimate concern also that uh, the anonymity, that is one of the key features of these uh, of these technologies could provide a very easy channel for uh, criminals that want to launder the money that they uh, made in, uh, in, uh, in illegal ways. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult question um, how, to, uh, how to tackle these private initiatives uh, with these private initiatives uh, in, a, in an effective way. Uh, I understand that, for instance, in the U.S., they are thinking about attracting these uh, these uh, uh, firms uh, um, under a sort of bank-like regulation, uh, and I'm still scratching my head because I think that the bank regulation is actually tailored to other type of issues, not to looking at the risks in the asset side. Well, for these companies, it's more probably, uh, as I said, anti-money laundering, governance, and uh, and uh, operational resilience so that they conti could continue providing their services through time. Digital Euro is, is, a, is a very important project. I think the central banks are right in uh, uh, moving in a territory that uh, uh, enables also citizens to benefit from these, uh, from these, uh, um, these innovations. There is, of course, a concern on the impact this could have on banks, uh, especially if you think a moment in which there is uh, a perceived uh, risk of a crisis, for instance, no? if everybody could move from a, a commercial bank deposit to uh, a, the digital euro at the central bank, of course, you would see everybody shifting their, their, their savings there. And by, by uh, construction, this would make the banks even weaker in a situation of an impending crisis. So we need to think about uh, mechanisms to have a proper interaction between commercial bank money and and the digital euro uh, and this will be i think it, the ecb has already announced will be a, a key area for uh thinking in the in the development of the project but it is a very very difficult area and uh, because it puts really very fundamental questions of why do we regulate financial firms and how far should we go in the regulation of financial firms yeah, definitely a topic to keep a close eye on. And since it seems we are running out of time, I am going to ask now the last question of today's session, which comes from Elena. Uh, she asks, what are the opportunities for young people to gain professional experience at the ECB? Oh, I mean, we are very, uh, first of all, let me say with some pride that uh, ECB banking supervision is a very young organization. So the fact that we were we are 
still I still think that we are a startup. We are doing a transition to a more mature organization right now, but we are still a very young uh, institution. We were set up in 2014, basically, so it's really very, very, very young. And uh, uh, we hired recently, which means that also in comparison to our colleagues on the central banking side, we have a, uh, an average age, which is, uh, which is uh, lower. And uh, I think that exactly because of the structural challenges that we have ahead of us, so um, green, digital, having young blood coming in the organization is, is very, very welcome. We have uh, a traineeship program, which is uh, a very important uh, uh, channel for uh, getting to know ECB banking supervision, working with us. And I can tell you that our managers are very keen to give also quite delicate uh, tasks uh, to the young uh, young trainees. And uh, and we do have also you know graduate programs. And uh, and uh, and uh, really, uh, I would invite uh, uh, all of you to you know, browse, uh, who are interested, of course, to browse our website and uh, and keep abreast of our uh, of our initiatives. Uh, we we really need uh, uh, young, motivated uh, uh, professionals to 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 join us. Yeah, absolutely. Having been an ECB trainee myself, I couldn't agree more. And I absolutely encourage all of you to keep an eye on our vacancies. And um, that concludes our Q&A session for today. That's the end of our event. And I would like to, of course, thank you all of you for your participation. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this session as much as we did. Please let us know by answering a very short feedback survey that we prepared for you um, on Slido so that we can not collect your feedback, which is very important to us. And obviously, we cannot end without properly thanking Mr. Andrea for joining us today. I hope that you also enjoyed the session, Andrea. I enjoyed it very much. I'm sorry that we didn't manage to cover all the questions, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And thank you very much, Georgina, for hosting this. Thank you. It was great having you here. And before closing, I would really like to encourage all of you to stay connected with us at DECB with what we do. Follow us on social media. And if you are interested, have a look as well, have a look as well at our website where you will find plenty of explainers about what we do, but also about more specific um, in initiatives that we implemented in extraordinary circumstances, as Andrea mentioned earlier, like the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, and please keep in mind, this is not the only initiative that we organize for young Europeans like you. We also offer competitions, scholarships to find master studies, which I encourage all of you to keep an eye on on our website. Thank you once again to all of you for sharing this Saturday morning with us. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your weekend.